24, verse number 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Do you all see that? Three questions that they had for for the Lord. Tell us when these things shall be. When not one stone is going to be left upon another. And that was the first question. The second one is. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And the third question is. And of the end of the world. And Jesus answered. And said unto them. Take heed that no man deceive you. Y'all hear that? Do y'all hear that loud and clear? The first instructions he gave his disciples, take heed that no man deceive you. For if many shall come in my name, say, lo, he is here, lo, he is there. Do not go after them. Take heed. For many shall come in my name saying I am Christ or I am anointed and shall deceive a few. No, no, no. Many. Many. It says broad is the gate, narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. There's going to be few that find the way of holiness, the way of truth. There's going to be more that go down that broad way than those that go in the narrow way. Amen. All right. Let's just uh, go to our lesson this morning. I preached a message years ago and it was very profound, it was to me. On the same title, we understand by books, but I, I'm approaching it this morning in a totally different way. Has everybody got the lesson? Look at page one. As you see there, the title of our text this morning is We Understand by Books. Not by visions, not by dreams, not by emotion, not by our feelings, but we understand by books. In the first year of Darius, the son of Adhazerus of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Now I want you all to understand and notice these words. Darius was made king. He did not get to be king because of his great conquering ability because he did not conquer Babylon. But we're going to find out how he became king, how he was made king. I, I, the more I study the Word of God, the more I'm amazed at the Word of God. Every word, there's no such thing as a fill in word. Every word proceedeth from the mouth of God. Amen. Every word. If it's a E-I-O-U, every word. 
It's amazing. And I tell you something else that's amazing is I'm going to show you one thing this morning, hopefully, that to show you how amazingly accurate and how this Bible is put together. It's breathtaking. But we just throw it around like it's some common book. I can read this like I read the newspaper. No, you can't. You can't do it. You got to have the Holy Ghost to read this Bible Amen. and understand it. If you ain't got the Holy Ghost, you'll never understand the Bible. Amen. That's why, notice the, uh, we understand by books. Where do we get the understanding from? Because I know the English language. No, no. Amen. We find out over in Matthew chapter 16 where Peter, he said, Jesus would look at his disciples one day and he said, who do, men, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they begin to reply, well, Lord, some says you're Elijah. Some says you're Jeremiah, you're a, a, a reincarnation of Jeremiah. Some says you're this, some says you're that. But Jesus looked and he said, but who do you say I am? And Peter, always the bold one, always quick to answer, always, he was very, uh, uh, he, 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 he didn't have too much patience, but he, sometimes he would speak profound things like this time. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Peter, son of our joint. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven revealed that to you. And he said, That's the, the, everything is based on revelation. If God don't give you the revelation, you'll never know. You'll be like those saying, Well, he's Elijah, or he's this, or he's that. You don't know except by revelation. He said, and if, it's upon this rock I'm going to build my church. It wasn't on Peter like the Catholic Church tells you. It was built on the revelation of who Christ is. Revelation. Brother Branham made this statement over and over in his ministry. What the church needs more than any one thing is revelation. That's the only way you'll know God. If he don't reveal himself to you, you'll never know him. That's right. You don't, he don't reveal himself to you because you belong to the church. You got to belong to him. Amen. I better get going here. I won't get done. All right. Notice verse 2. In the first year of his reign. Oh, I just, this, this, uh, these words here, they just really astound me. They just, cold chills run up and down me. I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. What does that mean to you? Nothing. What's he talking about? Well, we're going to get into this. Verse 3. I set my face unto the Lord God. Now, if we was right, I set my face to Fox to see what they had to say about this. I watched Fox News. The only reliable source of news that we have today is Fox. No, I'm afraid not. You got wrong theology. The only reliable source that we have for truth is the Word of God. That's the way he said the books he's talking about is the Bible. Now, here's something strange. Here is just something that's phenomenal. Not only did he set his face toward God, but look what else this fanatic done. 
now this is fanaticism to the nth degree to seek by prayer oh, boy that's a new one to seek by prayer and supplication well first of all we got we don't even know what supplication is <laughs> so how am I going to do that Tom and not only that but what else he say I quit eating huh I, you don't understand I got to have my three squares <laughs> I mean, this, this old flesh, he don't die easy. Have you all noticed that? By the time you think you're walking in victory, the old flesh shows up. Right. Right. I know what I'm talking about. That's the way it happens with me anyway. And sackcloth, not only sackcloth, but ashes on top of that. Man. This guy is fanatic. No, he's just a regular Christian. Or he would be. He, this is before there was Christians. This is the Old Testament. Remember, this is Daniel. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. And said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers and to all the people of the land Father we thank you for your blessed word this morning we pray again Lord that you'll help us oh God to bring forth the message that will encourage the folks this morning Lord as we delve into this word, Lord, may your Holy Spirit inspire us to speak words that minister grace. Oh God, may we, Lord Jesus, be revived in our spirits by the word of God. Oh Lord, we pray and ask these favors in your holy, precious name. Amen. After last week's message, that Brother Bruce preached, it had, it really inspired me. It really spoke to my heart. And I, I felt led to devote my time and prayers to the study of prophecy and, and to endeavor to bring to this body of, of church here a series of messages on end time prophecies and trusting that it will inspire you to as we see the dark and uncertain days that we are facing that we can that it will instill in us faith that it will instill in us a desire to reach into the recesses of this word to uncover and satisfy to our hungry souls what God has in store for them that love him and that keep his commandments. So this morning, this will be my first message in this series of messages on end time prophecies. I'm I've never done this before, but I've desired to. I was always afraid I didn't understand it. I may not understand it right, but I'm praying the Holy Ghost will just give us revelation as we take this step of faith. Why do I start in the book of Daniel? Well, number one, I've done considerable amount of reading 
especially in revelations and, and about end time prophecies and so forth. And one thing I found out, you'll never understand the book of Revelations if you don't understand Daniel. Because this is where it was talking about the end time and the events that's going to happen in the end time. It starts in the book of Daniel. So in this book of Daniel, we're this morning looking in chapter 9. It's in this chapter that God gives a revelation to Daniel of the 70 weeks of Daniel. And this is the whole, this is the foundation of end time events. It starts right here in the book of Daniel. Here in this book, in chapter 9, and that's what we're dealing with. Last week, if you'll remember, Bruce spoke on chapter 7. Well, I went home after that and I spent the whole week verse by verse in chapter 7. And it really lays a good foundation for chapter 9. But anyway, we're going to look at the 70 weeks of Daniel and it covers from chapter 9 and it starts at verse 24 and goes through 27 in the uh, ninth chapter of Daniel. But that's just the 70 weeks of Daniel, those three verses. But prior to that, and this is what we're going to deal with this morning, in verses 1 all the way through verse 23, it's concerning the prayer that Daniel prayed in preparatory in preparation before God gave him the significant revelation of the prophecy of the 70 weeks of Daniel. Did I make sense in that? So we want to look carefully at the, his prayer. Why? What brought Daniel to this place of prayer? And I just discovered something as I was putting this message together, and Daniel being a holy man, he's always considered a holy man. Because he was holy. He would not eat the king's meat because he, after he was uh, taken into captivity, he was, in, he was one of the uh, top echelons of the uh, people that ministered to the king. And it was required, they had to eat the, the diet that the king gave them to eat. But Daniel refused to eat it. He said, you all know that story. He refused to eat the king's meat. And they let him go ahead and he said, you let us eat what we normally eat as Jews. We have a particular diet. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing this. And he told the, the man in charge, he said, you let us eat what we normally eat. And if we don't look better after 30 days than what people do are eating the king's meat, he said, then you, you can do with this what you want. And the man agreed. Sure enough, after 30 days, they looked healthier than the king's people did. You all remember that? Well, it's in the Bible. It's there. Now, we're, this morning... As we look into this prayer of Daniel, we're going to uh, uncover some precious truths. Before he got the revelation of this tremendous revelation of the 70 weeks of Daniel was made, was made known to him, Daniel was found on his knees before the word of God and in prayer. You know, I come to the conclusion before you're going to find any answers to the questions that you have, there's only one source 
And only one way we're going to receive the answers is when we get before God with the word of God in prayer. Amen. There's no other way. Right. Amen. Now here is a here is a nugget for you. Note it's on prayer. You notice I got it squared off there. Note. Is everybody to see? I want everybody to see this because this is important. This is a nugget. There are three ninth chapters in the Old Testament, all of them containing a prayer of similar nature. And you'll find these three prayers in Ezra chapter 9, in Nehemiah chapter 9, and in Daniel chapter 9. So I want you, when you go home, I don't want you to start reading them now. Let me do my preaching. But when you go home, you'll make a point to look at Ezra chapter 9 and read his prayer. Read, read Nehemiah's prayer in chapter 9 of Nehemiah and then read chapter 9 of what we're reading this morning. That's Daniel's prayer. That is not by accident. Amen. There's nothing happens by accident in God's economy. But I thought that was, that's fascinating. In those, every one of those, in the ninth chapter of these books, you've got almost the same prayer. Three different prophets praying the same prayer. That's why the scripture, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word of God is established. And brother and sister, God has anointed your prayer. Amen. God, it's God that gives you the wisdom to pray. Oh my. You will, you will notice as you study the Bible, I hope you'll notice anyway, prayer and understanding of God's word are linked together. You don't have one without the other. Amen. All right. Number one thing that we want to look at about the prayer of Daniel here in chapter 9. What prompted his prayer? What was it that prompted Daniel to pray? Now you all know, if you know anything about Daniel, he was a man that prayed three times a day. He is noted from the very beginning of Daniel all the way through. He was a man of prayer. There's no there's no if and ands about it. He got thrown in the lion's den because he prayed. Prayer is the most misunderstood thing there is today in the economy of God and even in the world. It's totally strange to them. They just can't believe a human can touch God. You know? Oh, they had to read their prayer. Somebody else prayed. I've got a book at home. It is a fantastic book. In the Valley of the Shadow. And it's prayers of the old, the old uh, Puritans. And I tell you what, these prayers, I'm telling you, they're something. They're great. They're tremendous. Just like this prayer that we're looking at this morning that Daniel prayed. Mm. Well, Verse 1 tells us of the time of this prayer. Notice in Daniel chapter 9 verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus. So we know when, it, when he prayed this. Amen. Darius was not the conqueror who became king in his own right. But rather, he was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Now, remember, the, the image at Daniel seen, the head of gold, the chest of brass, or was it brass? Yeah, I believe it was. And then the loins, it was another 
minor, uh, another uh, lesser grade of metal, and then the legs and the toes was iron and clay mixed together. Y'all, y'all remember that? Yeah. And that first kingdom was was the Nebuchadnezzar at Babylon. He was the, the the head of gold in this big image. The second image was that brass. The in the chest was the Medes and the Persians. That's what the Medo Persian. They come and took the kingdom away from Nebuchadnezzar. Everybody, this is just basic knowledge. Everybody knows this. All right. But this man, Darius, shows up. But he was made king. The real king was a man by the name of Cyrus. Cyrus was a pagan. But God referred to him as a servant of God because God ordained him to do some things even though he was not a believer in the, in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was a, he was a, uh, uh, a pagan, unbeliever, but he respected God's word when God told him he respected it. And Sarah's was the uncle, or Darius was the uncle of Cyrus. He was Cyrus's uncle, Darius was. And so he made Darius the king of Babylon, the Chaldeans. That's what they, that was the kingdom of the Chaldeans. He did not, he was not a military leader like his uncle Cyrus was or his nephew Cyrus, but he didn't have the commission to do it. God gave it to Cyrus. Now, in your study of Dar uh, Cyrus, you'll find his name mentioned in Isaiah. He wasn't even born, but God knowed his name. And he testified, he said, I, Cyrus, my servant, he will fulfill this word. You'll find it in the book of Isaiah. I tell you what, that's amazing. Yes. All right. Now, when Daniel was getting this revelation, now Richard, I'm showing you here, this is for your benefit. When I wrote this, I'm, I'm writing this in here for Richard's benefit. You know, he's an old man. I know it because he's always talking about it. <laughs> he's old. But he ain't near as old as Daniel was when Daniel got this revelation. Daniel was 90 years old. He said, well, how do you know that, Tom? Well, hey, it's easy. Whenever he went into captivity by the Babylons, he was 20 years old. God had already said that, the, that the Israel was going to be in captivity for how many years? 70. Well, if they, and the, the time of the captivity was just about over. And that's what got Daniel so excited. Hey, this thing, is, it's happening now. The things are going to change. We're getting out of here. That's why he 20 and 70 is what? 90 years old. It's that simple. Hey, Amen. But we get a picture of Daniel being a young guy. Well, we all was young once. So it's not too late, Richard. God can use you. He can raise you up. I know he's having, has, you have spoke the prophetic word in the past, and that gift is still lying there in you. Amen. Gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Amen. Amen. You're born with that gift. Amen. So because you're old, that, and you know what? Moses was 80 years old before God ever spoke to him. So, hey amen, we're just in line for God to use this. Hey, I'm 80 now. I, I'm ready for God to speak. I hope. All right. Now, now look at it on page 3 here. Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books. The number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet 
that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. He'd already prophesied it. God's word cannot, it will not return to him void. Amen. At the time of upheaval and uncertainty, and what time are we living in? In the time of upheaval and uncertainty. How did Daniel, what did Daniel do? Well, I'm going to go join the Republican Party. I'm against this system. I'm going to fight against this system. I mean, that's what the church members today do. Bless God, I'm a Democrat. I'll be one till I die. Well, they'll still be a Democrat when they go to hell too. Now, but he occupied himself with the scripture. Have I seen that? Brothers and sisters, this ain't no time to turn from the word of God. This is the time to turn to the word of God. This is what everybody does that's seeking God. And I got put in repentance. This ought to speak to us. Y'all see that? I wrote that in there myself. But let's look at the books. Daniel said, I understood by books. You got your Bible there. Let's open them up to Jeremiah chapter 24. And let's just see what he wrote, uh, what he read. Jeremiah chapter 24. <clears throat> just keep your Bible open because we're going to look at all these places here. Jeremiah 24. Verse number 5. Start reading at verse 5. Now remember, Jeremiah spoke these words while they were still yet in Jerusalem. And Jeremiah, he suffered, he suffered untold misery because of the, these words of prophecy that he gave. I mean, it, he ended up in prison. He ended up thinking he was going to die in prison because of the word of God that he spoke. Thus saith the Lord God, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. Y'all see that? For their good. He sent them out of the land of Cana, out of the promised land, sent them down there to Babylon in captivity. For I will set my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. Y'all see God making a promise there? This is what Daniel was reading. 